The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 10, we'll be reading verses 24 through 39 there this morning. Matthew chapter 10, beginning with verse 24, reading through verse 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the Father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's old household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, as we hear a word from you, Lord, may your words be the ones that stir within us, while whatever words, Lord, I may put in the way are quickly forgotten. Help us, Lord, to hear what it is you would have us to hear, to be bold and courageous, Lord, to do whatever it is you have us to do, Lord, so that we may be called the people that you call us to be. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Did you catch what Jesus said in that passage? I did. I almost didn't want to read it. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I don't like that. Can I be honest with you? I don't, I don't like those words. I don't like them one bit. Don't like them at all. I don't like them because I don't want them to be true. I don't want to believe that Jesus, Jesus of all people and throughout human history, I don't want to believe that Jesus came to start trouble. That Jesus came to stir the pot. That Jesus came to cause division. <laughs> to set folks on edge and cause discomfort. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. I want to find a way to erase these words from Jesus, to wash them out of my Bible, to to replace them with words that remind me, as they so often do every year around December, that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I don't like these words. I want a better translation. Maybe that would help. I want a better translation of these words because they're just too problematic for somebody like me. You see, I like peace. I value peace in the world, peace 
in the community, peace in the home. I think peace ought to be one of the highest aspirations of every follower of Jesus. But then Jesus has to go and say something like this. I don't like it. I just don't like it. Now, one might think, as Jesus sometimes does, he'll say something kind of tricky, and then we'll go, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's going to clear it up. Jesus will clear it up. He doesn't. You would think that after these words, Jesus would sort of explain away that sort of, I didn't come to bring peace talk, but no. (laughs) Instead, Jesus says words that, let's be honest, you're in church, you have to be honest. Jesus says words that would get him run out of a community like ours. I mean, look what he says. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. One's enemies will take their place in the household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. These can't be the words of Jesus, right? Right? I mean, this is a misprint. Does it say the same thing in your Bible? I mean, this can't be right. After all, isn't family the most sacred institution? That's what people say. It's what the politicians say. Talk of family is all over our Christian culture, isn't it? It's in the commandments. Maybe Jesus forgot that part. You know, it says right there, honor your father and mother, not set somebody against one another. But here's Jesus. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother. Whoever loves their parents, either one of them, I don't care who they are, more than me, isn't worthy of me. Whoever loves their kids, any of them, even if it's the one who graduated first of the class in Harvard, is set up with a nice job, going to take care of you the rest of your life, or whether it's the one at the bottom who's always in need, always coming around with a handout and a sob story, it doesn't matter if you love any of them more than me. You're not worthy. You're not worthy. What's gotten into Jesus? This doesn't sound like Jesus. Not the Jesus that the church tells me. This doesn't sound like Jesus. What may be even worse, what may be even worse, though, about this less than family friendly talk is that Jesus says, Your enemies, your enemies, your foes, guess what? They get to come into the family. Don't love your mother or father or your children more than me, but your enemies, they get to come in the family too. What in the world is wrong? So uh, this is how I'm to understand this, right, Jesus? Jesus came to set families against each other and to graft enemies into the family tree. I don't like it. I don't like it. I'll tell you something else I don't like. All this talk about giving stuff up. I don't like it. Having to take up my cross, about having to to give up my life. That's what Jesus says. I'm not saying it. That's what Jesus says. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me, they don't get to be uh, last in line. They don't get to live down the street in the sub housing of heaven. No. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's what he says. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. I I don't like it. Christianity is supposed to be easy. It's supposed to make my life better, not tear it apart. Becoming a Christian is supposed to be about being blessed, about having good morals and righteous values, about not causing trouble, not, not splitting families, not losing my life. It's supposed to be about clean living, Raising a godly family, retiring without debt, living a quiet, age to a, a quiet life to a ripe old age. And then when I die, passing over Jordan to the other side where I get a robe and a crown and keys to a mansion. That's what it's supposed to be about. That's what all this is about, right? That's why we come in this room on Sunday mornings. That's why we get dressed up. That's why we come to church and sing hymns. Why we do all these things, right? Right? But here's Jesus talking about splitting families, 
taking in enemies, giving away all that hard-earned stuff, and dying. I imagine, I imagine, right after Jesus said this, when they're all packing up to move on, I can imagine that more than one of the disciples came, grabbed him by the arm, set him down on a rock. Now listen, Jesus, I know you get passionate about this sort of stuff, but it's not what we signed up for. Get back to talking about being blessed. Talk about happy things. Talk about healing folks. Tell those nice stories. Call out the sins in others. Talk about passing out food. Talk about doing those things. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But if you keep up this divisive stuff, we might just have to find a new Messiah. I imagine. I tell you, I'd be with him. I just don't like what Jesus has to say. I don't like it one bit. I don't like it because I don't want to believe it. I don't like it because it's contrary to so much of what I believe and hold true about my faith, about Jesus. He's a peacemaker, not a peace breaker. I don't like it because it isn't what I want to hear from Jesus. But you know the biggest reason I don't like it? Do you want to know, want to know the main reason I don't like these words from Jesus? You know what? You want to know what really makes me want to skip them? Just leave these words out. Take a razor to my Bible like, like Thomas Jefferson and just start slicing out the ones I don't like. Or maybe take a dark marker and just mark over these verses in my book. Do you want to know what it is? What really troubles me most about these words from Jesus is that they are true. And I know they're true. And I can't do anything about them. I know they're true because I know the rest of Jesus' story. And most of you do too. Jesus came teaching, healing, feeding, welcoming. Not once anywhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus showed up and pulled out his sword and just started swinging. Not once. He didn't come swinging a sword, didn't come leading a, an insurrection. And yet they came, fully armed, swords in their hands, and arrested him. Jesus came speaking the same message that can be found in the Hebrew Scriptures, a message as old as the religion and movement itself. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Yet the ones who loved to quote Scripture and claim its authority hated him. Jesus came speaking about life, what it really means to be alive, about eternal life in the kingdom of God, a kingdom that was closer than they could imagine. He spoke about life, and yet they killed him. It wasn't that Jesus didn't come intending to bring peace. Rather, it's that when one comes preaching peace, preaching the kingdom of God, preaching that there ought to be a way to make a way for peace. When one comes with a message of love and inclusion, you had better believe folks are going to start drawing their swords. Because the message of the kingdom of God isn't one folks generally want to hear. It's one folks don't want to hear because it calls out our inadequacies. It's one we don't want to hear because it shines a light on our shortcomings. It's a message we don't want to hear because it tells us that others are just the same as us. And we are just the same as them. No matter how hard we work to prove to ourselves and others that that's not true. We don't like to hear these kinds of words from Jesus. Because if we're honest, if I'm honest, these sorts of words betray our true motives in life and religion. They show us to be selfish people. Folks who value comfort over the hard work of equality. Folks who value complacency over the conviction of the Holy Spirit. People who are often satisfied with our slice of the pie, even if there are so many others sitting around with empty plates. Jesus didn't come to bring peace because peace doesn't just happen. It isn't a magic word that we just speak and then hope Everybody gets along. It's not a victory to be won by whoever has the biggest or the most swords. Peace 
is the product of hard, faithful work that comes through discomfort and the shaking of the status quo. And those things, if only for a season, those things produce discord and frustration. And in the worst case, as in the history of our churches, all the way down through even the time of Jesus, violence and terror. It's because deep down, even those of us who preach peace, we only really want it if we can get it our way. And the Jesus way is always, it seems, counter to my way. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Because if you truly seek to follow Christ, to do what Jesus calls you to do, to be who Jesus calls you to be, it may set you against your father as he clings to comfort of a rose-colored past. It may set you against your mother as she hopes for your future to be one of comfort and safety rather than of boldness and risk-taking in following Jesus. It may drive a deep wedge between you and your family as they fail to understand why you're so passionate about feeding the hungry, or clothing the naked, healing the sick, loving your enemies. It may cause you, it may cause you some unease as you welcome those who for years you would have sworn were your enemies, as those who've hated you simply for who you are or those whom you've hated simply because of who they are, and you find out they may actually be among your best friends. It may cause you to lose everything you've worked so hard for as you give it all away without condition or question. As you strive to do what Jesus calls us to do, to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It may cost you more than you have to spend. It'll cause you great pain and anguish, cause you to lose family and friends, and it may even cost you your very life. But Jesus says, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. You wouldn't be the first. Jesus has been there. And Jesus is still there. Jesus says, I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. One's foes will be members of one's household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who will find their lives will lose it. And those who lose their lives for my sake will find it. I don't like it. But I know it's true. I just pray for the strength. To believe it. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you have set before us troubling words. You set before us, Lord, so often a troubling call that calls us away from all that we know to be safe and to be sure. Give us the courage, God, to answer such a call. Give us the strength, O Lord, to be full of the courage to not be afraid when the ground beneath us shifts. To not be afraid when we hear your spirit so clearly speaking to us that we are frozen in our tracks. Help us, O oh God, to be brave enough to live in such a way that we bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Even if it causes us pain, even if it causes us discomfort, even if it causes us to lose everything we hold dear. 
Give us the faith, God, to know that it is you who calls us, that you have been there before us, you go there with us, and you see us through it all the way through eternity. Holy Spirit, Spirit, be with us now. Speak to our hearts as you call us to the ever-challenging but ever-fruitful call of your kingdom work. In the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.